Godzilla X Kong The New Empire has made oodles at the box office and has been received by fans fairly well. But there are some of us who aren't so thrilled. Actually, we think it's pretty bad. Hello everyone, my name is Kido. And I am Mio. And the fifth entry of the MonsterVerse has a lot of people talking, so we're just weighing in with our opinions. But because it's been only a week since the movie came out, and because some of you asked in the community section, we'll be making a very quick, spoiler-free portion of the video. Starting with good things that may make you want to see the movie. Monster action! There's plenty of it. Kong dominates the screen time, but Godzilla does some stuff as well. And there are some new titans. As Kido said, Kong is there a lot, so if you're a big fan of Kong or King Kong, then this is the movie for you. The pacing isn't great, it's a little bit too fast-paced, but it is better than Godzilla vs. Kong, with more extended monster action scenes. And if you like really loud, dumb action movies like Transformers, then this is the movie for you. As far as bad things in the movie and why you may not want to see it, it's not the kind of movie for people who like to think a lot, because if you think more about this movie, the worse it gets. The human story is overall worthless and a waste of time for the most part. Godzilla does some things while he's there, but he is barely there, and it's kind of confusing why this movie is called Godzilla X Kong. The movie is dumb fun, but it still takes itself a little too seriously. The movie might be more fun if it went full warbat crap crazy and did some more wild stuff. So hopefully, that helps you figure out whether or not you should go see the movie. If you like the MonsterVerse, I think you'll probably like it. If you don't like the MonsterVerse that much, kind of like us, then probably hold off. And before we get into the spoiler section, we're going to talk and address briefly some interesting arguments we hear against people who don't like the movie. Such as, you can't compare this movie to Godzilla minus one! Well, yes, we could, although we're not going to for a majority of this video. The movies are in the same franchise, so it makes perfect sense to draw comparisons between the two movies. And while they're different, we personally think that Godzilla minus one is objectively better as far as quality goes. But if you prefer Godzilla X Kong, then that's just your opinion, and that's fine. You just don't like fun! If liking this movie is a prerequisite to liking fun, I guess I don't like fun. However, there are plenty of fun movies that handle being a fun movie better, and it, I like those movies, so I do like fun. I just don't find this movie very fun. You only watch Godzilla movies for the monsters, nobody cares about the human story. I'm not sure if that's actually true, because the highly regarded films in the franchise, at least both by fans and people outside the fandom, are typically the ones that have better human stories. Plus also it makes sense to have a good human story because Godzilla only makes up like 8 to 12 minutes of the film, on average. <laughs> It's just like the Showa films! Kind of, kind of not. There are some similarities, but there's also quite a few differences, such as the way the Toho, older films in the Showa era, embraced the goofiness. It seems like Godzilla X Kong is still taking itself a little too seriously. But that's just our opinion. You can have differing opinions if you want to, but hopefully you respect ours, and we respect yours. And hopefully no one gets too butthurt either way. Time to dive into the meat of our review to explain why we feel this way. But just so you all know, this is like our fifth time attempting to record this video. So, um, we are coming up on our deadline, so this is not going to be a super edited video. So, sorry about that. To start things off, let's talk about some good things. There's quite a bit of monster action, and Kong has some very good action scenes, specifically when he first meets Suko and he uses him like an nunchuck. Kong also fights Scar King, which is a pretty unique idea, since I don't think Kong has ever fought another giant ape on the big screen before, unless you count Mechanic Kong from Toho's King Kong Escapes. The addition of Kong using traps was a good way of displaying Kong's intelligence, and it also felt believable. They were advanced, but not too advanced. Godzilla shows himself to be a complete bad butt and slaps some monsters around, and this movie really shows just how strong of a titan he is. He then evolves into a supposedly stronger form, although it's not obvious that that form is stronger because he was plenty strong before. Godzilla vs. Kong The Rematch is okay to see even if it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. We'll get to that later. I do think the characters maintain what they remember about each other from last time, and Godzilla tries the move that worked out against Kong last time they fought, and Kong knows how to avoid Godzilla's ray better, so at least they have a bit of continuity there. And there's Godzilla no! suplexing Kong, which is one of the moments of all time. Now on to the more bad things in the movie, but there will be some good things mentioned still, although we don't really like the movie, so not too much. Continuing on with the action, it's incredibly silly, and I feel like we've lost a lot of the weight and scale behind the action scenes. The fights are basically MCU fights, but the characters are supposed to be big. I think the previous movies featuring Godzilla did a much better job of really showing the scale of the monsters, and this one just is kind of absent. For instance, Suko is supposed to be like 150 feet tall, which is like half again the height of Kong from Kong Skull Island, but I would never be able to tell! The Godzilla vs. Kong rematch only happens because Godzilla refuses to think about the situation, despite the fact that Godzilla is gearing up to fight Scar King, not Kong, but then he sees Kong and his instincts scream, DESTROY! And he charges in. I guess this shows Godzilla is rather forgetful because he was presumably powering up to help the Iwi. Somewhat related to that, the whole Iwi distress signal plotline kind of falls apart when you think about it. They used to signal every time a Titan threat happens, I guess, even when it's on the surface. And then they signal Godzilla to prepare for war despite the fact that their guardians would have been Mothra and Kong, I think. 
not Godzilla. It's just kind of confusing about who the Iwi rely on for protection. To finish the action section of our review, the final fight was pretty disappointing. The stakes don't feel very high. Shimu and Scar King just don't feel dangerous. And all things considered, they were doomed from the start. Shimu was already dominated by Scar King, and Scar King was already beaten by Godzilla. And by the time we get to the actual final fight, it's only Scar King and Shimu. There's no, like, ape army or anything. And then a lot of said battle is spent running around and jumping around. There's a bit of tackling and some punching. But the scene just doesn't feel kinetic or intense enough. And it doesn't doesn't live up to the end fight in King of the Monsters or Godzilla vs. Kong rounds two and three. It feels very much like the final fight in Pacific Rim Uprising. Like, a lot. It all just feels very lightweight. In general, I had a hard time caring about most of the fight scenes because the plot is life draining bad. Speaking of the plot, let's move on to the plot and the story at large. The human story is more or less non-existent. The plot is a complete mess, and the only character development is Gia, as she finds her people and then still decides to stay with Eileen, and Eileen deciding that she might have to let her go, but in the end not having to. The storyline with Gia is very forced. We give up on the movie when they're going through Scar King's really dumb backstory, and then they clearly state that Gia is the chosen one for some reason. They must have an Iwi from Skull Island to wake up Mothra, and there's no real justification for why that has to be. It's just a really clunky way of attempting to tie the human story with the monster story. The whole chosen one thing may sound very silly, but what is she going to have to do in order to wake up Mothra? Well, you see, she puts some paint on her head, walks up some stairs, reaches into the air, and that's it. She's in no danger, and much like your average politician, she never has to make any sacrifices to accomplish her goals while innocent people die in the Titans battle on the surface. The main reason this feels weird is because they hype up this moment like she's going to really be in danger, but she never really is. Then somehow she disappears? She's either running on top of Mothra, or she's like been absorbed into the spirit energy, or something happened. In the end, Gia ends up still being with Eileen, and it's a heartwarming moment that I don't care about. Human stories in monster movies and other sci-fi films is actually a pretty interesting subject, so perhaps we'll do another video on that in the future. As to the monster story, it's a little bit better. There's not much there, but Kong completes his story arc by finding a family and adopting Suko, who was originally very antagonistic, as an adopted son. Overall, it's okay. In concept, this conclusion is fine, but in execution, it's a bit lackluster, and unfortunately highlights the fact that this movie would have been better as just a Kong solo movie. Still, it is the most interesting and entertaining part of the movie. Godzilla's story is just him killing monsters, powering up, going to sleep, and joining Kong for the final battle after a brief scuffle. This movie is not Godzilla x Kong, but Kong with Godzilla a la carte. Rumor has it that the original idea for the movie was Son of Kong, and that seems very believable. Kong's story takes the majority of the runtime, and we spend almost as much time with him as we do with the humans, although I kind of wish we spent even more time with him rather than the humans. And one thing that the story does really well is a non-verbal communication between the monsters. Kong and Sugo have some touching moments, and he and Scar King have some clear reasons not to like one another. Scar King wants to stay in power and kills wantonly, only to use his fellow apes for his own goals, and Kong values his species and his family more than anything. Kong's conviction is shown when he saves an ape that attacked him from falling to his doom. But then the ape attacks him again and then Kong kills him. Sort of souring that moment, but it was still good. Overall, the story fell flat for me, and by the time the credits rolled, very little has changed except Kong has found his people, uh, apes, whatever. Continuity-wise, this story, compared to the rest of the MonsterVerse, is about as bad of a leap since Godzilla King of the Monsters and Godzilla vs. Kong, because those movies barely seem connected. Godzilla's personality in these last two movies is completely different than it was in the first two. His mission is no longer to be maintaining the balance, now he just wants to kill. Mothra is a total mess. How did she get down to the Hollow Earth? Is this the same one as the egg we saw at the end of the King of the Monsters? And if so, why is she connected with the Iwi now? They also ignore the chance for any world building, and there are surprisingly very few returning characters, so the film seems very disconnected. Like is gone. Like is gone. Although uh, a little bit of world building was there, they added the whole vortex explanation for how to get to the Hollow Earth. Apparently the Hollow Earth is both the same caves that Godzilla can zip through, and also the world inside the plant that houses whole ecosystems. Honestly, I don't think they had a clear idea for what they wanted for the Hollow Earth, and they kind of changed ideas part way through, is what it seems to me. Also, a quick note on the editing. The editing of this movie is pretty bad, with like jarring cuts and weird shots of characters that don't matter before the scene ends abruptly. This is surprisingly sloppy for a blockbuster film. Also, the pacing bounces between breakneck speeds and painfully slow. But since we've covered the story in general, let's take a moment to talk more about the individual characters. Starting with the returning human characters. Eileen really isn't worth mentioning. She's just walking exposition. She has this one scene where she explains the backstory of Scar King and the whole Iwi needs to wake up Mothra thing. That scene was honestly very miserable and she definitely made it worse. 
I find Bernie just as annoying as he was from the previous film. I felt that in some areas I was starting to get his part of the team dynamic and I thought he was okay, but then he'd open his mouth and say a few too many lines and I'd lose it. They really just needed to tone him down a bit. He has sort of a dynamic with Trapper, but they're both such boring characters uh, they have no reason to be in the story and I don't care. He also spouts exposition at times. Quick note on the exposition, when the characters explain something, they oftentimes over explain things that don't really matter, but then other things that really need to be explained are just completely ignored. It's weird because I thought you were supposed to turn off your brain doing this movie, but then exposition just pops up at the wildest times. It's not always just stuff that we don't care about that's explained, it's things that are completely obvious to the audience. And we hate to say this last part, but I don't think the actress for Gia is very good, or at least she isn't well directed. She always looks like she's on the verge of tears, or pouting, or she's constipated, something. The actress has said that she likes working on the films, and as a child actor, she's not terrible, but she's very meh. Oh my, but that's not all, we have new human characters. The main addition being Trapper. Trapper is a wild child, and he's very quirky. He's not horribly interesting though, he's just there for a couple of laughs and to encompass some plot points like giving Kong the Infinity Gauntlet. And he has a possible romance with Eileen, or at least there's some kind of friendship before, but that's not really explored. It is, however, interesting to have someone who's a little bit more, like, happy about the situation, like, oh yeah, this is cool, guys, you know, this is awesome, so that kind of adds a new kind of character idea, I guess. In additional side characters we have, uh, some lady who's the director of some kind of thing, I think the Hollowworth Exposition or something. She's played by a possibly bad actress, and she has barely little to nothing to do with this movie. Every decision is handed off to Eileen. Mikhail is added for no reason, and he's just killed for some sort of joke. Which is a shame, because I found the downer negative disposition refreshing, and he could have bounced out the human cast quite well. Also, it was very telegraphed that he was going to die, and that's not very cool. We also have the submarine captain guy who was only there to explain what was happening during the Tiamat fight to the audience. His character is portrayed by some of the worst acting we've seen in the MonsterVerse. But how's about those Titan characters? The movie has plenty of Titans, although a few of them feel kind of wasted. And the CGI is notably worse than other MonsterVerse films, probably because of the lower budget and the higher number of Titans. Also, so much of this movie takes place in the Hollow Earth, and it feels like 90% of this movie is computer generated. But back to the characters. Starting off with Godzilla. He's just a big bully. I don't really like how they handled his character in the last two movies, though I appreciate a little bit of the bad guy again, as I prefer him as more of an anti-hero or villain, but it's just very inconsistent with the previous two films. His evolved design is fine. I'm still not sure about the pink color, but it's okay. And that said, he was very OP before supercharging. He doesn't do a whole lot in this movie, but what little he does turns him from King of the Monsters to just a bully and a tyrant who just goes kills the other titans when he wants to or he thinks he needs to, I guess. Like Tiamat was just minding her own business and all of a sudden she's dead. And we have Kong, who we've talked about a little bit already. He's the best character, and I enjoy his expressive eyes and face. He speaks a lot without saying anything, and that is something that is a little bit difficult to achieve in movies sometimes. His part in the story, is, like we said, is the best part of the story, though it would have been nice to see him trying to protect the humans at least once. Or at least the Iwi or something. But these movies don't really care about saving people anymore, so it's just action. Zuko, I just don't like the design because his head is so freaking big. But his interactions with Kong also are the best parts of the movie, as previously mentioned. And presumably he's Scar King's son, but that isn't really all that explored. Then we have Scar King. He could have been great, but he was underwhelming. From his origin story, we already know that he lost to Godzilla once, and he almost lost to Kong in their first fight, so there's no feeling of intimidation. Scar King has the most character of any MonsterVerse villain, but that may not be a good thing as he feels kind of like an anime villain with his quirky posing. As far as Shima goes, she's also very underwhelming, mainly because she was so overhyped in the trailers, and she barely does anything. She's best described as dumb as a box of rocks, and her CGI is awful, perhaps just because she's stark white, and maybe that doesn't translate very well into the CGI environment. I honestly don't know why the trailers made her so mysterious. Like, I thought she'd go like, oh, she's a big match for Godzilla or something like that, but in the end, she didn't really accomplish all that much. And then finally, Mothra. Uh, she's just kind of thrown in there. Not sure if I really like the new design. It's similar to King of the Monsters, but it's just a bit off or something. Her new roar sounds just don't really work. There are other monsters like Scylla. They were just wasted, literally. Tiamat, also wasted, literally. She was had a pretty cool design. Thought when she was gonna fight Godzilla, it was gonna be pretty cool, but it was really short. She just got slapped down in seconds. The other monsters, like the sea serpent and the wart dogs, just kind of exist. Like, I guess it's cool to see different monsters. And the other apes in the uh, Kong tribe, or whatever they're called, are okay. I guess one or two stood out. The old ogre-looking one and the older ape that Kong helps. They're more of a plot device than anything, and but their designs are varied enough so they look different from each other. By the way, we're also extremely tired. It's past midnight at this point, so sorry if the recording's done to fall apart. A lot of things happen because they need to happen for this story to progress. Like, it was very convenient of them to be right next to the base, which so happens to have the Kong Beast Glove, which so happens to be fully operational. And thus, there are many plot holes in the story. We were going to mention them all here for its own section, but the filmmakers clearly didn't care about the existence of plot holes, so we'll try not to either, for the sake of making this video relatively concise. We will, however, mention one massive one that is 
pretty stupid. Skulking uses a crystal to control Shimu, but he uses the crystal as a weapon at the end of his bone whip thing. That is very silly because he has to reach to the end of the very long weapon to use the crystal. That is in a very vulnerable place. Maybe it's worth risking the crystal getting detached, which is what happens in the movie, if the crystal spike is indestructible, super sharp, or has some special power. But it doesn't have any of that, it's just sharp as any sharp knife. The bone whip is also not indestructible, as the bone whip is broken. And the crystal itself isn't indestructible because it gets destroyed by Kong's axe, which means he quite possibly could have destroyed his greatest weapon in his first fight with Kong if he just swung the whip into Kong's axe too hard, which is pretty dumb. I know they're doing it for like, oh look it's so cool, uh, he's got the thing at the end of his whip thing, but it just doesn't make any sense. Well you got me. By all accounts, it doesn't make sense. If we were to rate this movie, we'd probably give it like two, maybe for being generous, three Godzilla suplexes out of 10. Now we really do not like this movie, but we just wanted to say that even if you think that this movie is good, that's fine, and if you think this movie is bad, but still like it, that's also fine, because we like a lot of bad movies as well. For instance, Jurassic Park 2, Godzilla Final Wars, the Star Wars prequels, a couple of Transformers films, stuff like that. Some of these because they're so bad that they're good and we enjoy them, others just because we find them generally entertaining, even if they are fundamentally flawed. Movies can also have an unrealistic plot, but do it well. Things don't have to be dark, grounded, and gritty, but it is much nicer to have a plot that you can be more invested in. It's not the goofiness we don't like, it's the lack of quality and laziness. The Showa films were a lot more successful at being the silly Godzilla films. For one thing, the movies were obviously marketed towards children. Not that children's media has to be bad, or adults can't watch the movies, but it's clearly not supposed to be taken seriously. This movie comes close, it's obviously ridiculous, but it is rated PG-13, which sends a confusing message. Also, the older movies have that older movie charm, that VHS feel. Yeah, <laughs> boy and weird dubbing in tokusatsu make for a pretty fun experience. Additionally, the human characters, for the most part, were a lot more fun to watch in those movies. They wouldn't mind if the MonsterVerse movies were more like the show films, maybe they could even be better, but the only thing that they've really improved upon are the visual effects. Beyond that, they seem kind of stuck halfway between being a real movie and a goofy homage to the classic show of films. A great modern example of an unrealistic but more serious modern movie of the same genre is Pacific Rim. Obviously the giant robots fighting monsters thing makes no sense logistically, but they craft a narrative that makes you forget about all those issues and focus on the story. Plus in the confines of his own world and what they previously established in the movie, it kind of makes sense. I think one thing that makes the movie better is if the script went through more drafts to get more potential out of the story and the movie itself, because right now the human story is like, eh, pretty bad, and I think they could have done a lot better if they just like tried harder. I also think it would be better if they removed Godzilla's part in the movie and just made it a Kong solo movie. I know that probably wouldn't sell well because Godzilla's a bigger name, but I think it would make for a more solid film. Also, maybe take out some of the jokes, or maybe write better jokes, because most of the jokes in this movie are usually just meant for like cheap laughs. And bringing a sense of scale and weight back into the MonsterVerse would probably help future installments. But more than likely, I don't think they're going to change anything for the future. Warner Brothers and Legendary sure love money, so they're probably going to continue with the whole Godzilla and Kong movies, and continue with the whole like, oh, it's big dumb fun, it sells well. So I don't really have too much hope for the future, but who knows? Godzilla Minus One did do pretty well, so maybe they'll take a few cues from that movie and implement that into a couple of their projects. One idea that'd be interesting is if they finally acknowledge how many people's lives were ruined by these titans, because so far it's like, oh, the titans are here, they're destroying stuff, but we don't really dive deep into how that affected anyone. So maybe they'll have like a, I don't know, Godzilla Civil War thing or something in the future. Perhaps that'll help acknowledge how destructive Godzilla can be when he's supposedly taking care of the surface world. And that's our review. But since I'm sure most of you enjoyed the movie, please let us know if you agree with our criticisms, and if not, do you think that Godzilla X Kong is a really good movie in itself? Is there anything that could be improved? Or is it perfect as is? And whether you like this video or dislike this video, thanks for watching so far. I'm glad that you took the time to hear us out. These are just our thoughts. And if you like our thoughts, feel free to like this video. And feel free to subscribe. We have a lot of videos planned that are going to be pretty cool, like the Not Safe for Work King Kong ripoff movie, and the Russian Avengers movie everyone hates. But until those videos come out, feel free to check this video out over here. Or this video over here. And until we see you there, he's Mia. And he is Keto. And we hope that you have a blessed day. Bye! Bye.